There's something evil in this house. We have to go now. It won't let you leave. What won't let me leave? If you run out, the magic will make you crawl right back. I watched it last night. It's very scary. Watched it like this. <laughs> um, just want to know how the project, you know, started. Where did this I idea come from? Mm-hmm. So you know, it, I grew up Jewish, even though I don't have a Jewish name. Uh, my father wasn't Jewish, but um, I ended up in New York at a rabbinical school um, okay. after college. I, I'm not a rabbi, but I studied there and did, and I was very interested in mythology and both theology. And that's how I had first learned about the Shomer, someone who watches the body. And that concept, you know, had always stuck with me. And so when it came time to kind of write something like the vigil, I, I, I had that idea and I thought, wow, how could nobody have thought of this before? Or, or at least maybe they did. And maybe there were a lot of scripts, but no one had made a movie with that, you know, setting. And I thought, that's something scary. Someone should do something with that. So I kind of poured all the stuff that I had learned into this um, and tried to make it, you know, as authentic as possible, but still true to being a horror film. Yeah. Yeah. And it's your first feature as well. I understand. It is. Yeah. Yeah. What was like the most challenging aspect or perhaps the most unexpected challenge you just didn't mm. come in? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, I think uh, one one interesting piece that I, I didn't anticipate necessarily when I yeah. thought when we were kind of going into production was I wanted to film in these communities, like in the actual Hasidic communities, on the streets, you know, right there. And I had been told beforehand that, you know, they're not going to be that welcoming, potentially, because, well, you know, they're going to want to know what you're doing here. Like, why are you filming? Yeah. And so the suggestion was you should try to kind of go guerrilla style, like get a small camera and kind of hide it and shoot like that. And I, that just wasn't the look I wanted. So I wanted like a big dolly track and like, you know, 50 crew members and everything. And so once we got there and started shutting down the streets and stuff, uh, sure enough, we had, you know, like 150 members of the community. At one point it was like two in the morning, 150 Hasidic men kind of surrounded the set. And luckily I had a couple rabbis on hand who could like I could deploy to different parts of the street and explain what we were doing yeah but, you know that definitely was something that I I didn't anticipate I, there's already enough to juggle that when you're thinking about um okay the, the, the how the community is going to be interacting and reacting with the set uh was something different and new yeah have you always wanted to make a film I know your background's in like writing novels and said you went to rabbinical school yeah, yeah. And then I, I actually had a career in clinical research that I did. Okay. That, that was my, this is kind of my second, second life. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I had an interest in film in high school. I, I wanted to be a film director, but I had no idea how you could do that. Uh, Coming, yeah. I grew up in Denver, in Colorado, here in the States, and there was, I had no Hollywood connections or anything like that. So, uh, I didn't pursue it. And it wasn't until much later after I'd been a writer and started writing screenplays and kind of learning things. I spent about 10 years writing scripts. And through that, I was able to meet enough people and kind of get enough of an understanding to say, okay, I don't need to go to film school. I think I can try to do this myself. And so I made a short film and that short film led to the vigil. Yeah. And did your medical experience come into play as well? I know one of the characters has Alzheimer's. Yes. Yeah. In fact, I did research. Some of, a lot of my research was in nursing homes where I worked with a lot of people with dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, and so a lot of kind of her character and kind of yeah. like just that house and just the feel came from that directly from that experience. Yeah. So religion and horror have always been, you know, connected from The Exorcist. And one of my favorite horror movies is Under the Shadow as well. Oh, yeah. It's um, a great movie. A great movie. Yeah. Um, why do you think that they have such a tie? Like, mm. It just works so well. It's such a good genre to explore religious themes in. Yeah, I think it has to do with kind of horror, at least kind of like in, in, in true horror as it's defined has a supernatural element. You know, there's ghosts or there are demons. And, and it has to do with the afterlife, right? All of it, The Conjuring, whatever, all these films, Exorcist, 
in, invoke something that there is life beyond this life. And people are fascinated by that. Everyone has that question. What happens after I die? Am, am I just going into the ground or is there something more? Yeah. And so it seems like it's almost in, intrinsic to horror that religion is going to play a role because religion in a way is the guide uh, for us to navigate those difficult questions. And, uh, you know, so I, it felt like for me, it was, I'd seen The Exorcist and loved The Exorcist. And I'd seen a lot of the, you know, a lot of religious Christian iconography. So I wanted to do yeah. something, had something different from a different perspective. Yeah. And did you look to any of the horror movies for inspiration? You know, when making a movie? Yeah. You know, one movie that I was really inspired by is a film. Um, there's, there's a, obviously the exorcist was one. I just love the grounded nature of kind of, of how everything happens in that. There's another film called angel heart that I like. Uh, uh, quite a bit as well on a visual level um and you know there there were a few others that i there's there's one called possession it's a 1981 film that kind of what i was most interested in was kind of the emotional reaction to f to being in a situation that you can't explain mm -hmm. and that you can't get out of <laughs> and just how do you how do you take a character put them in that situation and and try to go through those emotions as they're trying to figure something out. That was, it was important to like, look at films that were doing that. Yeah. 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 It's quite an emotional movie. It's all about, you know, confronting the past. And we also have mm. our main character, the, you know, the anti-Semitic hate crime. So I just mm. from reading was something that you, you know, witnessed yourself. Yeah. When I was in New York, I had seen some kind of just whatever, just some guys on the street who her harassing a little Hasidic boy they, you know, wasn't quite as violent as is in the film. Yeah. But it was shocking enough. It was shocking enough. And, and the thing that was most shocking was how nobody did anything, including myself. And I was just kind of this bystander to it. And I felt a lot of guilt about it afterwards. And it was just like, how does this happen that we can let people do this and that this happens? And what did it do to that boy? And like when he went home after that, what is his impression of the world? And is he afraid to go out again? And it explained a lot in some ways of why communities bunch together and isolate themselves, um, which explains a lot of what, how the Hasidic community lives in New York City. Yeah. One of my favorite things about the movie is the score. It's just, oh, yeah. I think scores and horror is so integral anyways to building suspension, but I'm not sure who did the score, but um, yeah. why was it so important to you to have this, I suppose, incredible score? Yeah, no, it's Michael Yazerski who did the score. Um, and he he and I talked for a long time about kind of what this needed to look like, what this had to feel like. I think the initial reaction, kind of when we were first talking about it, the, the, of course, the first idea was like, well, you we should make it sound Jewish. It should be like Yiddish music. It should have violins and stuff like that. Yeah. And I said, no, 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 we're not in, we're not like in Eastern Europe. This has got to be modern. This is in New York City. So I, I wanted a kind of very industrial sound. And it turned out that Michael and I both kind of have, a, you know, really like the band Skinny Puppy and kind of this early industrial music. Um, and so we incorporated a lot of that into this. And it was interesting because the sound design and the score kind of have to work together very closely. Yeah. And it's hard to tell a lot of times what is score and what is sound design because <laughs> they're kind of bleeding over into each other. And I, I really, that was something I, I really loved in, in Ridley Scott's Alien. Mm -hmm. It's almost impossible to tell what is the score in there and what is the sound design because it's all kind of these electronic noises and yeah, yeah. strange whistles and stuff. And uh, so I really wanted to kind of do that. Yeah, and Dave Davis, you know, absolutely great in the lead role. You had yeah. to come on board and what about him made you think, right, he needs to come on board? You know, it's funny. I had seen Dave Davis in movies for years. Like, for example, he was in Logan. Um, but I didn't recognize him because he's kind of very chameleon-like in that he's changing his appearance all the time. Yeah. And when we were casting The Vigil, I just happened to see this movie called Bomb City where Dave has a three-foot green mohawk and he plays this punk rocker in the 80s. And I, I had just looked at his face and I, I just saw something really emotional and I said... Like that, that guy, like he, that's the type of actor I want. And I told my producers, look at this guy. This guy's, this is what I need to find. And they said, well, why don't you just contact him? I was like, mm -hmm. okay, I'll, I'll give it a try. <laughs> so 
I, I emailed him and he responded and uh, he read the script and he really loved it. And it turns out that his family's from a very similar area in New York, New Jersey. Okay. Um, it has a very similar history to mine, in fact. And so, you know, we kind of bonded over that. And then, you know, from the very beginning, I had told the producers that for this film, there are three locations. There's New York City, Brooklyn, technically. There's the house that this film takes place in. And then there's the lead character's face. That is like our primary location because that is where the camera is going to be. And it's going to be wordless, a lot of it. So that performance, I need it to be right there. And Dave is just expert at doing that. It was very funny as well. One of my favorite, I suppose, moments made me chuckle was when he's searching how to talk, how to, <laughs> how to, talk to women. Yeah, yeah. He's very good at um, how to <laughs> fear, but also the, the comedy, which is something yeah. you've, I think you really need in horror movies. You need that. You, know. you do need that. And it's funny that that moment came from a very real moment in that, I'll, for example, in the beginning of the film, we see this uh, this group that meets and talks about how they kind of relate to the to the, the non-Jewish world. Because these are this is a, help, yeah. it's a self-help group, essentially. And that's based on a very real group. And the people who are at that table were all part of that group. They're, you know, some are actors, some are non-actors, and they are they're okay. there kind of replicating the meeting. And the thing of looking up how to talk to girls came from one of these people who, you know, in their community, their marriages are arranged. They don't, they don't meet girls and date. So when this guy had left the community, he had no idea how to talk to women. Um, and so he just Googled it. And so I thought, that's <laughs> great. We got to We got to include that. And we'll have Dave kind of just be very naive and, yeah, how, you know, in the modern age, how else would you learn if nobody taught you? You just kind of go yeah. online and try Although, and figure it out. I don't think, I don't think the internet will have the correct answers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Yes, yeah. indeed. Um, we were pretty excited when Blumhouse came on board. You know, they're still doing such great work in the horror genre, we're really mm. the forefront of that. Yeah, and I've been a big fan of Blumhouse for a long time. So after we had our premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival, um, I was in Texas at a, a film festival called Fantastic Fest at uh, the Alamo there. And um, uh, I got a call from my manager that Jason Blum wanted to talk to me and yeah. needed to fly out to LA the next morning. <laughs> so I kind of cut the festival sh short and flew out and met Jason. And, you know, it was amazing. It was amazing to be in his office, you know, with all those posters, Insidious, yeah. and, all, and all these things, and kind of talking to him about the vigil. Um, which he really, really loved and wants, you know, at the time was like, we need to distribute this. And uh, so it was, it was huge. It was really exciting. And I'm really excited for the U.S. release, which will be in the fall. Um, and kind of what Blumhouse has planned is exciting. And what's next for you after, I believe, Stephen King adaptation? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, so that is also with Blumhouse and Universal. And that's Firestarter. Um, so it's a kind of new adaptation of the book. Uh, I'm a, I was, you know, when Jason kind of pitched Firestarter to me, it was exciting because that was one of my favorite Stephen King novels. Yeah. Certainly growing up it was. And I, while I really did like the 1980s film, I felt like we could do something new with this. And then when I read the screenplay, which is written by the guy, Scott Teams, who wrote Halloween Kills, the upcoming Halloween, yeah. um, it's an amazing script. It's an amazing script. It does it kind of both has everything you'd want in a Stephen King, you know, a new adaptation of Firestarter. If you want to see people's heads catch fire and see their faces melt off, <laughs> you'll get that. Uh, but if you also want to see a dad and his daughter on the run trying to survive being chased and this kind of heightened emotional, very tense experience, you're going to have that too. So uh, it's something exciting. We're hoping to film it this year, um, you know, COVID withstanding and uh, you know, it's it'll be a lot of fun yeah yeah it must be exciting for you as a Stephen King fan as well <laughs> it is you know, uh, right I, I definitely was it was not anything I expected you know when I was kind of charting the course after the vigil in terms of what other projects I had been developing and other things that Stephen King was definitely not something that I had thought would you know come to me so it's both humbling but also really really exciting yeah yeah and does he have you know, involvement in it? Like, would you have meetings? He does to a certain extent, yes. I mean, he watched the vigil uh, and kind of approved me as director. And okay. he also it was very involved. You know, he read the script 
from its earliest stages to its latest. He's very, very happy with the script, which is great. Um, and he, you know, he's excited for this kind of this fire starter. So, uh, you know, his involvement, you know, it's there. It's there kind of the whole way. Yeah. Uh, one final question, because I just love asking horror directors this. What, oh, sure. What's the movie that scares you the most? <laughs> that scares me <laughs> the most. Let's see. You know, uh, you know, you know, it's interesting. I, I feel like the some of the films that I that I kind of have sleepless nights with would be something. Mm, there's a, there's a bunch of them. <laughs> Let me think of the, the the best one. The best choice here um, would be you know there's a movie called Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. That's like a okay. it's an incredibly disturbing kind of. It, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's a serial killer film, but it's got this amazing central performance that is just so haunting and so disturbing that that film, even though it doesn't have a supernatural element, it still feels very true to horror. Um, and it's a film that if you've seen, you'll never forget, which in some ways is kind of not a recommendation because <laughs> if you've seen it, you will never forget it. Um, yeah. But it's so well done. And, uh, you know, it is just, it's so effective that, that it scares me. It definitely scares me a lot. Yeah. Well, I had a sleepless night last night, thanks to your <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so. sorry, but good, I'm glad it worked. <laughs> yeah, it worked.